Welcome to the DIM 400 lecture on hip dysplasia. I'm Dr. LaRue and I'll be giving these lectures. For hip radiography, a grid is needed because most body parts or hips in the large breed dogs are more than 10 centimeters in width. Sedation or GA is needed for accurate positioning and for radiation safety. And symmetry of the pelvis is important for hip dysplasia grading, as you'll see a little bit later. The two required views in South Africa for hip dysplasia grading are the extended and flexed ventrodorsal views. With the extended VD view, the patient is placed in dorsal recumbency, and the head and neck need to be held in a straight line with the long axis of the body, and the median plane of the thorax needs to be kept absolutely vertical to the table. The hind limbs are extended by pulling gently, cordially, without causing any discomfort to the patient, and the toes are held so that they touch. The points of the hocks are rotated out and the stifles are pronated so that the patellas form the highest point on the stifle. Under no circumstances must the limb be forced down towards the tabletop. The primary beam is centered on a transverse level through the greater trochanters. With correct positioning, the femur neck shaft angle is 130 degrees. Here's an example of how the extended VD view can be performed without hand holding by using positioning devices and ties. To ensure symmetry, the following conditions must be met. The coccygeal vertebra need to be superimposed over the pelvic symphysis. The transverse diameters of the obturator foramina and the transverse diameters of the ileal wings must be equal between left and right. With correct rotation of the femurs, the patellus will lie in the midline and will be the highest point of the distal femurs, and the femoral shaft neck angles will measure approximately 130 degrees. There will also be equal superimposition of the femurs over the ischial tuberosities on the left and on the right. Compare this incorrectly positioned image to the previously correctly positioned image. There is slight rotation towards the left side with this um, obturator foramen being slightly smaller and the femur head to neck um, and shaft angles are 180 degrees, which is completely incorrect, which is completely incorrect. If we look at the positioning or the effect of rotation, if the patient is rotated towards the right, there will be less acetabular coverage on the right and greater acetabular coverage on the left. The right obturator foramen appears smaller and the right ileal wing will appear wider. The radiolucent pelvic symphysis will also be displaced relative to the coccygeal vertebra and will lie on the side towards which tilting took place. So in this case, towards the right. If the patient is rotated to the left, the opposite findings will occur. So there will be greater acetabular coverage on the right and less acetabular coverage on the left. In some cases, it might be difficult to get metrical hip positioning, and then we have to look at reasons why. For example, in this case, there's sacralization of the last lumbar vertebra. So this patient has been tilted towards the left. You can see that this obturator foramen is smaller. And the reason for the tilting is because the left wing um, or the left transverse process of L7 has fused with the ilium. So L7 is behaving as if it is a sacrum and hence it's called sacralization. Findings are similar on the right with the transverse process here partially fusing with the ileal wing, but it is much milder. So we'll have a look a little bit more at this when we do the section on the spine. The flexed view, the flexed VD or the frog leg VD view is an additional view for hip dysplasia in South Africa. It's also good um, to look for suspected femur head physial fractures. Again, the patient is positioned in dorsal recumbency. The head and neck again must be in line with the long axis of the body and the median plane of the thorax must be vertical to the table. 
The hind limbs are in a normal unassisted flexed position with immobilization aids such as foam pads. So the femurs need to form an angle of 45 degrees towards the midline. If this is not the case, then the hocks can be pushed towards the perineum slightly um, without tilting the pelvis. Here's an example of how the flexed frog leg view can be performed without hand holding by just using positioning aids. So looking at a bit of a of normal anatomy of the pelvis, the green dot is the center of the femur head. The cranial acetabular edge is the yellow line and shown without it on the image, it's that line there. And the dorsal acetabular edge is this curved line or curved margin seen with the femur head superimposed over it. The fovea capitis is a normal little indentation in the smooth femur head, which is normal. This is where the femoral capital ligament inserts. And the obturator foramen is this radiolucent area or the, the hole in the floor of the pelvis, if you want to call it that. The acetabular fossa is essentially just the acetabular recess. And um, the acetabular notch is an extension seen as this radiolucent area over here, um, a caudal extension of the joint. The femoral neck should be narrower than the femur head, and the femoral neck should have smooth margins. The pathophysiology of hip dysplasia is as follows. It's an inherited condition, and that's why it's seen more in some breeds than in others, but environment will also play an important role. It's a developmental condition, which means it can progress up to 24 months of age, and it is not congenital, which means that the hips of all dogs are normal at birth. The joints continue to develop normally as long as full congruency is maintained between the acetabulum and the femoral head. As soon as there's joint laxity and incongruency, subluxation will result, resulting in coxarthrosis or degenerative joint disease of the pelvic or of the hip joints. Hip dysplasia shows polygenic traits and it's only moderately heritable. That's why it makes, it makes it very difficult to eradicate. There's no sex predisposition and it normally occurs in fast growing breeds, especially large breeds. Radiologically, it's not seen before four to six months of age. On this radiograph of a skeletally immature dog, note the physes are still open, both femur heads are located outside of the acetabulum and hence showing severe subluxation and severe hip dysplasia. It's been postulated that rapid growth, high calcium and low protein diet, as well as excessive exercise, all also play a role in the development of hip dysplasia. So when we look at the radiological signs of hip dysplasia, it's generally split into two main things that we look at. The one is subluxation, and then we have at least four things that we look at to qualify the subluxation and to assess to see if it is present or not. And then the end result of the subluxation is the development of degenerative joint disease. And then there are also several things that we look at when we decide whether DJD is present or not. So first we'll look at subluxation and we'll cover each of the following, femoral head coverage, medial divergence, lateral divergence, and the Norberg angle. For example, in this radiograph, again, there's total subluxation of both femur heads. They're completely located outside of the acetabulum and hence this is a case of severe hip dysplasia. So for femoral head coverage, what we essentially mean is that there should be at least 50% coverage of the femoral head by the dorsal acetabular rim. So in the image on the left, it's very clear that this dorsal acetabular rim running over here covers at least 50% of the femur head, where on the right side image, it's more like 20% coverage, if even that. We can also say that the center of the femur head should be located within the dorsal acetabular rim. So on the left-hand side, the center being approximately in this area here is located within that dorsal acetabular rim 
whereas on the right hand side the centre is located far outside. When we talk about medial divergence, we are talking about widening of the medial aspect of the cranial joint space. So we only evaluate this initial or outer one centimeter of the joint space, and then medial divergence will occur medially. So medial divergence refers to this crescent shape widening of the medial aspects of the cranial joint space shown by this blue triangle. Essentially, medial divergence is just telling us that there is subluxation present, even though um, it might be mild. Lateral divergence just refers to widening of the lateral aspect of the cranial joint space. So there's this triangular lateral widening shown by the, the blue triangle. And in this patient, there's also medial divergence present, as the medial aspect of the cranial joint space is also widened. Then when we look at the Norberg angle, this is the angle that is formed between a line that joins the center of the femoral heads and then extending cranially from the center of the femur head through the craniolateral acetabular margin. So there will be two Norberg angles, one for each side on the left and on the right. Here's another example of the Norberg angle calculated by joining the center of both femur heads with a line and then extending this line towards the craniolateral aspect of the acetabulum. And then we will get an angle on each side. And the Norberg, normal Norberg angle should be greater than 105 degrees in the normal dog. As the Norberg angle decreases, it indicates that there is subluxation present because now the femur head center is essentially moving laterally and out of the acetabulum, and then the angle will decrease. And in this case, you can see that the angle is almost 90 degrees on each side, which is abnormal. So when we look at the radiological changes of DJD, first we'll look at tramlines. Now tramline is just a word that describes osteophyte formation on the cranial margin of the femoral head parallel to the physial scar. So this line over here on this radiograph is the physial scar and this white line over here will be the osteophytes. On a post-mortem um, specimen, these are the osteophytes, these little irregular new bony projections on the femur head. So remember osteophytes or new bones or new bone that forms at the articular surfaces, so at the edge of the articular cartilage. And it is an indication of degenerative joint disease. Now Morgan lines is another word for enthesophyte formation. So enthesophytes, if you remember from previous lectures, are new bones that form at the insertion of tendons or ligaments, or in this case, the joint capsule. So this little bit of new bone formation over here on this post-mortem radiograph and in this post-mortem specimen are consistent with the enthesophyte formation on the caudal margin of the femoral head. There is some confusion about the terminology Morgan lines because some textbooks refer to them as osteophytes. But it's accepted that capsular insertion um, will result in enthesophyte formation and not osteophyte formation. Here's another example of a Morgan line. That, it is, that is what it will look like on the extended VD view. On that side, there's a bit of sclerotic new bone and on this side. So on this radiograph, it's pretty easy to see that the Morgan's lines are located some distance away from the articular surface of the femur head. And thus, the word enthesophyte is much more applicable than the word osteophyte. An osteophyte would be at the articular margins. Unfortunately, again confusing, um, some textbooks like to use the term caudolateral curvilinear osteophyte for Morgan's lines, but I've just highlighted again here that it is actually an enthesophyte. Here's an example of what um, the flex view adds 
to um, evaluation of the radiograph. Here are some osteophytes there and an osteophyte here associated with the articular surface. There's the fovea capitis, that's that sort of indentation on the femur head, which is normal. And then the Morgan's lines or enthesophytes is this new bone at the capsular insertion. So on the radiograph, there's an osteophyte of the femur head and then caudally over here is the Morgan's line or enthesophyte at the capsular insertion. It's all of this bulgy new bones sitting here. Our remodeling just refers to the loss of the normal femur head and neck shape due to osteophytic and enthesophytic new bone. So any new bone. Example, this femur neck here is very wide. It's almost as wide as the femur head because of osteophytic and enthesophytic new bone all around the neck. Lipping just refers to articular osteophytes at the acetabulum and bilabiation refers to the flattening of this cranial acetabular margin. It's normally meant to be a nice little block shape coming down here and bilabiation just means that it's been worn away because the femur head is no lo longer located within the acetabulum but rather subluxa subluxated and then pressing against that area. So here's an example um, of a hip radiograph for you to assess, a hip pause, and then take a few minutes just to see what changes you can see in this patient. All right, so the first thing that we can look at is femur head coverage. You can see that the center points of the femoral head on both sides lie outside of the dorsal acetabular rim. And also, there will then be less than 50% coverage of the femur head by the dorsal acetabular rim. In this case, it's probably about 35 to 40%. There's medial and lateral divergence present on both sides. And there's also signs of degenerative joint disease already present in, in this patient here. So if you look carefully there, there's a Morgan's line on both sides. There's our osteophytes associated with the femur head on either side. And then there's thickening here of the femur neck also, so consistent with remodeling. Here's another example. Does this dog have hip dysplasia? And one can spot a mile away that neither femoral head is located within the acetabulum, indicating subluxation and thus indicating hip dysplasia. I've just put in a post-mortem um, example about of what hip dysplasia will look like. This is the femur head and this is the acetabulum. And you can see on the femur head, it's meant to be covered by a nice, smooth, um, glistening, bluish uh, white articulation surface or articular cartilage. And here it is hyperemic. The articular cartilage is completely fragmented and this femoral head is flattened. It's no longer nice and round. And the acetabulum is also affected. There's hyperemia, there's sort of fragmentation um, of the labrum. And so this is a severe case of hip dysplasia. So for hip dysplasia grading, two quality or good quality radiographs, so the extended and the flexed VD, need to be submitted to a veterinary radiologist. And in South Africa, we use this FCI grading scheme and they use letters of A to E, A being the best and E being the worst. The German Shepherd Federation has their own scheme um, and they've got their own scrutineer as well. The patients need to be radiographed at a minimum of one year of age. Rottweilers and very large or giant breeds are done at 18 months of age, and elbow dysplasia radiographs can be taken at the same time. The patient needs to be identified with a microchip or a tattoo, and the information of the patient needs to be identified permanently on the images. The forms need to be filled in by the owner, so the owner signs a declaration, and then the copy of the registration papers of the patient need to be attached. 
So we'll go through a couple of examples. Um, for the gradings, the left side is put first. So the first um, grading, an A1 in this case, so this is perfect hips, refers to the left side and the next one refers to the right side. So in this case, one can see that the Norberg angles, if we had to measure from the middle outwards is more than 105 degrees or at least 105 degrees. Um, these joints are nicely congruent. The femur head follows the acetabular margin very nicely. There's no signs of subluxation and there are no signs of degenerative joint disease either. This is in contrast to this patient's hip, which E2 is the worst grading they can receive. So the first E2 refers to the left and the second E2 refers to the right side. And in these cases, there's total subluxation, there's shallowing of the acetabulum, there are um, osteophytes around um, the femur heads, and there's uh, Morgan's lines or endothesophytes over here as well, and thickening of the femur necks. Here's just an example, again, of a very nice hip. So A2 is a very good um, grading, and this patient, Again, there's very good congruency. Um, there's maybe very, very slight medial divergence um, and very slight Morgan's lines and maybe enthesophytes here. But overall, this is a very good hip. Again, compare this to a grading of E1, E1. Um, this patient, the center of the femur head on both sides is located outside of the dorsal acetabular rim. There's less than 50% coverage of the femur head. Um, there is definitely medial divergence present on this side with a bit of lateral divergence present on the right side. And there's severe remodeling of both femur head and necks due to all of this new osteophytic new bone and there will be enthesophytic bone also extending down here. So these are very bad hips. It's also uh, possible for patients to um, present with asymmetrical hip dysplasia. So in this case, the D2 hip is on the left-hand side. Um, there is subluxation seen as medial divergence. It's not seen on the opposite side, which is an A2 hip, which is a very good hip. Um, the center of the femur head on the left-hand side is located outside of the dorsal acetabular rim, and there is thickening of the femur um, neck with osteophytes and enthesophytes indicating DJD, which are not present on the good hip. Here's just another example of an E1, E1. It's very obvious to see all the degenerative changes um, and the subluxation, which is severe. And here's also osteophytes on the cranial acetabular edge, um, as well as some bilabiation. So it's also flattening of this area that should be a nice pointed margin. Here's just an example of those same bad hips, um, just to show what additional information the flexed VD shows. Um, it really shows the femoral head osteophytes nicely. So there's a osteophyte over there, this side not really so severe. And then it shows where the Morgan lines are situated. So this over here, all of this new bone sitting here, it should be a nice smooth margin following the little pointer there. And this is all new in thesophytic new bone um, that one will see on the craniocaudal or the, on the flexed um, on the flexed view view. This is seen on the extended VD view in this area over here. So for breeding advice, it's best to breed good scores with each other if possible. Certain breed societies have strict restrictions on what grades can be bred with each other. Overall progeny testing would be best, but this is not practical. Um, individual sires will produce more offspring, so the male dog has greater impact on overall population and therefore preferably should be an HD grading of at least an A. But it's important to look at the whole dog, um, also look at the elbows and um, obviously behavioral things, etc. So that's the end of the hip dysplasia radiographs.